Today is April 28th. Brian Reynolds has anchored down in Pittsburgh, signed for the rest of the decade. Oh, and the Pirates win a series against the Los Angeles Dodgers this week. It's the Bridge to Bucktober podcast. Yins guys, thank you for listening to the Bridge to Bucktober podcast where we talk all about them Pittsburgh Pirates and that. My name is Josh and you just get me today. It's Friday. So Jake is working a late one and so today it's just me. Um, it was a late night record again, so I don't really have the ability to get a hold of somebody else <laughs> to try and say, Hey, you want to stay up till 1030 and hit record then, um, and, and record a podcast with me. Um, I just don't have it in me to try to get somebody to do that. So, um, but Jake is, is, is working a late one tonight. And so he's not going to be able to be here. Uh, it makes it a little bit different now that he's in the central time zone. Definitely makes it like, because for me it is around 1030, but still like 930 for him. So makes it a little bit different. Um, We got a lot to get into here. Pirates win a series. Brian Reynolds gets signed. Drew Maggi makes a debut. There's just a lot of things that kind of happened all at once. And, and I think the drama of losing the opener to L.A. kind of adds to that a little bit. So uh, let's, do a little, let's do a little injury update here. We'll get through some injury updates because we did have some news. Andy Rodriguez should be back at DH in about three to four days if you're following that. There was kind of a scare that he was going to be injured for an extended period of time. Uh, but he should be catching about seven to 10 days from tomorrow is what it says. So he'll be, he'll be back. It's not anything super serious. Uh, I would imagine they're taking it slow with him. I think that would be the smart move. Nick Gonzalez went on the seven day injured list. I believe this was all today. Uh, well, so that'd be Thursday with a left shoulder strain. And the worst news of all, Mike Burroughs, uh, had Tommy John surgery Wednesday, 14 to 16 month recovery. So we talked at the onset that Oviedo was going to be a guy that was going to come in for, uh, you know, the first guy that was either injured or struggled or anything like that. And it was right out of the gate. It's Brubaker. He's down. Oviedo steps up. Ortiz is going to be one of those next guys coming in. Um, and then we talked about Mike Burroughs. Uh, Quinn Priester, maybe not quite getting the uh, the outcomes that you would like right away. And so what we talked about at the beginning of the year was this depth that starts with Brubaker being there and then moves into, you know, getting its way to Mike Burroughs, who's on the 40-man roster. And, you know, that depth starts to go away with with injuries like this. And you got two of them down right away. Um, and you hope that you can keep the rest of the guys healthy. Uh, but that's definitely something to be watching for. Um, however, one of the other guys that we said was going to get uh, their debut this year has been called up and added to the active roster, and that's Cody Bolton. Will Crow placed on the 15-day injured list with right shoulder discomfort. And so Cody, Bolt- Cody, Cody Bolton gets added. Um, also... Kanan Smith and Jigba optioned. They opted to keep Drew Maggi on the roster. More on that later. Reynolds was activated. Uh, Tyler Heineman was DFA'd to make room for Cody Bolton. Um, and so we'll know that within, you know, with so long, if somebody does put a claim in on Heineman, um, then that's somebody that we will either work out a trade with or, um, you know, work something out there. So 
that's kind of the update there. Let's get through the games a little bit. Let's move right through them. I, I'm going to move a little bit quick today. You know, without Jake, there's there's some of those um, some of those conversations that you can have when you have somebody else here. It's not always easy to do something like that. So uh, let's get through the games here. Um, you know, the interesting thing coming into the season or into the series here with LA is that Max Muncie, the National League or I think Major League lead in home runs, not going to be here. He's on paternity leave. What's really interesting about that is they've had a lot of paternity leave lately. I believe there was a couple of them actually not in this series because of that. Uh, Mookie Betts just returned from paternity leave. And side note, Cody Bellinger, who's now on the Cubs, who was on the Dodgers last year, another paternity leave right now. And I was listening to somebody talk about it, and they said basically it lines up with the All-Star break last year, which L.A. was hosting. So I'll let your imaginations run for a second. That is, um, you know, for you adults, pretty interesting. (laughs) So Tuesday. Um... Today was something new, but Tuesday was not. The Dodgers scored first, and the Pirates lost, but not so fast. The Dodgers did score first. Pirates answered with one, and then in the second inning, take the lead. And then take a 7-2 to two lead in the fourth only to see one more run come in in the fifth, two more in the sixth, three more in the eighth. Could have been three more in the sixth. Stevenson gives up what could have been a three-run homer to Mookie Betts. Jack Sawinski brings it back, which really just kind of, I think collectively we all say, man, there's something really special. How many times, I will ask you this, how many times in the last week and a half have you said, there's something special going on? How many times have you found yourself saying there's something special going on? I can't be the only one. I can't be. When it's all said and done, Oviedo goes five and a third, gives up four earned, walks two, and that was the big thing. Those two walks, I think, in that start were the ones that 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 kind of hurt him the most. Four strikeouts, still has a 303. He's really getting out of this with just a rough start, and then that's it. We move on from that. Go get him next time. Stevenson comes out, finishes the inning, barely one of those runs comes in, and the three-run homer that could have been by Mookie. And then Jose Hernandez comes in and gets two strikeouts in a clean inning. And work your way to Holderman, who had his outing that I think we all um, felt like could have happened another time he was out there, but it didn't. He's been getting away with it. Once again, it's a big walk, in my opinion, that makes the difference. Um, He gives up three, the lead, and eventually that is the game. Uh, I believe I heard them say on the broadcast that's the first home run he's ever given up in major leagues. Am I really that mad? I mean, Chris Taylor's a great player. He's a very clutch player. We've seen that over the course of the past so many years. And I got to think that it's just not something that I'm worried about with Holderman. Uh, I think he bounces back, and I I just can't be that concerned about it when he's been as good as he's been. Um, man, the story of this game going up, when you get the five run lead, the whole thing was Drew Maggi. There was a big story about Drew Maggi here. Um, we know that all the rumors went about Reynolds, but that really wasn't, um, official until the next day. But the, the Drew Maggi story of him not getting in, and there's a lot of conversations. Matthias gets the pinch hit for 
hedges and draws a walk. Start off 0-2, draws a walk. Great at bat for Matthias. But I think a lot of people, myself included, had the conversation of whether Drew Maggi could have gotten that at bat. Knowing that Reynolds was coming back off bereavement the very next day, assuming that Reynolds was going to be the one, or that, that Maggi was going to be the one that was sent down. And I did feel like there was a little bit of a miss. If you were going to bring him up, and I know that there's a lot of people who would say, well, Guy Davidson deserved to be up there in the first place. If that's the case, and you brought him up just for the feels, you had to get him in that game. You had to. But I don't think that that was the scenario here. I mean, they are first and foremost going to try to win games. And we've talked about this so many times that the way that they're managing games, the way that they're treating everything is to win. And that's been really interesting. And it was proven in that moment. So he doesn't get the at bat. Everybody assumes it's the same thing that happens to him before. Um, however, there's more to come there. Um, good to see Syndergaard get blasted. We all know what he said uh, um, a few years ago. Four innings, nine hits, seven runs, and a home run. Uh, so always good to tattoo Syndergaard a little bit and and pay for the slander that he said about the Pirates. Of course, we all made our blackout jokes that Syndergaard wishes he'd blacked out and and so on. Uh Hedges takes a beating in this game. Bay with another error. Sawinski has a good day. Um, McCutcheon hits the homer, which he doesn't come through with the bases loaded, but you're not even in that scenario without the three-run homer. Um, but Sawinski with a couple hits, including a double and the robbed home run, was a big day. Um, so we go on to Wednesday. Uh, Drew Maggi does get to make his debut here, but... Not before Roanzi Contreras takes a no-hitter into the sixth inning um, and loses it. But he does not. I mean, he still only gives up the two hits in six, two walks, five strikeouts. On 87 pitches, he does not go out for the seventh. Uh, probably a good move, the Pirates at that point. Um, had a three-run lead, and then they added two. Stevenson has a clean inning. Moretta just gives up a home run to Freddie Freeman. Not a big deal in that scenario. I mean, you've got the big lead, but he finishes two innings, four strikeouts as he continues to, I guess you could say, be effectively wild. He's not, you know, a lot of deep counts, you know, not hitting the strike zone consistently. Um, definitely has some movement. Uh, definitely effective. Brian Reynolds, uh, or uh, Brian Reynolds goes one for four with an RBI in this game. McCutcheon has an RBI, one for four. Santana, one for four. Sawinski, one for two with two walks. He continues to take patient. Uh, plate appearances. But it was the bottom of the order that was the most effective here. Rodolfo Castro bouncing back. We talked about him needing to bounce back in this series. He goes two for four with a couple RBIs and a double. G1 Bay gets three hits in this game and continues to be this uh, interesting player for the Pirates. He makes uh, He makes a really bad error in the outfield. Just an easy fly ball on Tuesday. He, he goes out there and and he's playing second and then ends up moving to center field late in the game. Um, but <laughs> it's like 0 for 4, 0 for 4, 0 for 4, 3 for 4. And it kind of evens the whole thing out to be, you know, at a decent uh at a decent place. But the biggest thing is, man, you get him on base. And he causes havoc. Three stolen bases in this game. And this is what happens when Bay gets on base. But it wasn't just Bay. Santana gets a steal. Sawinski gets a steal. 
Bay gets the three. Castro gets a steal. I think there were six, a total, yeah, a total of six stolen bases in this game. Nine in the first two games, which is how many the Dodgers have had in the whole year. A lot of stolen bases for the Pirates right now. They lead the major leagues with 37 steals. Cleveland is second at 31. And the difference between those two teams is the Pirates have 30 home runs to Cleveland's 13. And this was kind of a point that, you know, it's one thing if you're saying, well, yeah, we lead in in steals, but, you know, maybe we're not, we rely on the speed. We don't have the power. This team's really doing a little bit of everything. Really kind of showing you, I don't know. I'm not going to jump there yet. Jason DeLay, three for three in this game with a double. I'm uh, I'm drinking this cream soda, and I have to keep muting my mic. Cream soda is probably like anything pop, anything bubbly, probably not the best idea because I have to keep muting my mic so you guys don't listen to me burp. You don't want to hear that. All in all, a very good game for the Pirates. Eight to one. They take care of business. And the the whole thing about this, before we get into the Magi debut and, and the at bat, was after Tuesday's loss, a lot of comments about this is the kind of loss, this is the kind of gut wrenching loss because you had the five run lead that spirals them downward, that makes them crash. This may be the end of of the streak. This may be the beginning of a downward spiral and it just doesn't happen. The team comes right back. Eight more runs, seven the day before, eight more runs. Pitching shows up. They get the eight to one win. Just great. So in the eighth inning, McCutcheon's at bat is coming up. You have the lead, and you could see it in the in the inning before that. They were telling Maggie, get loose. You're going in, bud. 13 years in the minor leagues. He gets his at-bat, jumps on the first pitch, hooks it way foul, gets, <laughs> gets a, an automatic strike called against him for a pitch clock violation. Fouls the ball off, which makes the pitch clock violation not matter, and ultimately strikes out, uh, to which is probably not a surprise to a lot of people. Major League debuts uh, can sometimes be nerve-wracking, very nervous, situations like that. In this case, you had a guy who had spent so much time grinding and not giving up on his dream finally gets his opportunity has to be more nervous than a 21 year old just has to be has to be more emotional so they announce that he's hitting and they announce that it's his major league debut as if they would for anyone and I kind of question to myself like the people that are at the game do they know what's going on do they understand the scenario? And that was without question they knew. And I, I got to tip my hat to everybody that was there that made that moment a little more special. What a cool scene. Uh, baseball has a lot of a, a lot of room for emotion. It's the game allows it. And so we can be analytical about Drew Maggi and what he should be and whether he should be there and all those things. But really, man, these types of moments are totally worth it. They're totally worth it. And they're, they're worthy of being special. There's plenty of room in baseball for emotion and that's exactly what this was. 
nothing more, nothing less. We all know that there's not like these grand expectations for Drew Maggi moving forward with the organization or anything like that. This was just a really cool moment. Kudos to the organization. Kudos to the fans that were there for making it what it was. To me, this kind of stuff is worth it, especially right in the middle of something that the Pirates are doing that is, I guess you could say magical. I I don't really think it is. Uh, And maybe we'll get into that a little bit more here in a minute. But either way, kudos to everybody for making that a really special moment. Um, and congratulations to Drew Maggi. Um, I, I don't know that he goes to Washington <laughs> with the team. We haven't had any announcements yet. I, I don't know that it happens. And the reason I say that is because of the fact that he got the start on Thursday. Had he not started on Thursday, then I could see them taking it through the weekend. I really could go to, go to Washington with us, go on a, on a road trip with us and, you know, be available and probably not play. I could have seen that being in the case. The fact that he gets the start over key Brian against the lefty, which I would think they would want key Brian in the lineup there. Um, it was a little bit surprising but I think it's also telling to me, and, and maybe I'm completely wrong on this, but give him his start, give him some at-bats, give him the ability um, to contribute, maybe get that first hit, whatever. That's the best way to give him a, a full chance to do so. He did not get that first hit. He was 0 for 3. Um, but that's it. He's likely headed down. Uh, to back to double A, um, and I, I don't really actually feel here I, to, like speculating. I, you know, um, I could go off of some other speculations. Gary from the fan forum they had their their live episode tonight. He's saying it's probably Anduhar. Um, that's probably likely. Um, it's I just. In this scenario, I'm I'm just not ready. I don't know. Ryan Vallade has been playing some third and corner outfield, so it's possible he's another right-handed bat. I guess it just depends on who you want to DFA later, who you'd rather get rid of first if somebody wants to call him up. But at the same time, you're paying Andujar more. Maybe it makes more sense. I don't really know what uh, – he's been hitting well. Um, Vallade hasn't been bad, so I, I don't know. I guess it could go either way. I said I wasn't going to speculate, and then I did. Right? Par for the course, of course. So on Thursday, Brian Reynolds, two for four, has a nice day. McCutcheon gets a hit. Um, but Brian Reynolds with the Brian Reynolds with the double. Marcano with the two strike bunt kind of sparks some things going there. Um Man, just a lot happened here early, very early. Joe with the two-run homer. Castro follows with the back-to-back in the sixth. Um, That was when they basically put the game away. So you have the gut-wrenching loss on Tuesday. You turn around and you win 8-1 and 6-2. Mitch Keller goes six innings, five hits, two earned runs, a walk, and 10 strikeouts. Underwood throws an inning and a third. Jose Hernandez again comes in, lights out. And David Bednar actually closes out the game because he hasn't pitched in a little while, um, and he had hit a clean inning himself. Jose Hernandez, guys... (laughs) We've been saying we don't know, we like it, but maybe it's rough. He's the only lefty in the pen right now, and he's getting it done. Sitting right now at an 093 ERA. He's getting it done. He looks good against lefties specifically. But this team is... 
not going to lay down and they had the opportunity to do that on Tuesday. Or actually on Wednesday and Thursday. And instead of instead of doing that, they just went right back at it, man. And I guess it's a question of like when do we when do we check in here? When do we check in full go? When do we say all right, I'm ready to risk being wrong because we've said we're enjoying this while it lasts. We say things like have fun with it because we don't know how long we'll be playing like this. There's a lot of questions like that, but are we ready to, are we ready to check in here? Because this is one thing that this was our first you know, tests, they say, oh, you're beating the Reds and you're beating the the Rockies and it's it's no big deal. I mean, the Dodgers are not the Reds and the Rockies. Sure, they didn't have Max Muncy. But they went out and beat Julio Urias today. Answered right in the first inning, too. You went down, they answered right back. I don't know, guys. I, I, I don't know. We are trained as Pirates fans to believe that this will not last. <laughs> We're trained that way. Those of us who have been watching closely are leery of saying, no, this is, this is, this is long term. Those of us who have not been paying attention are slowly coming on board. We're slowly saying like, yeah, I'm ready. I, I, I just got to learn their names. I was told that today by my cousin. He's excited. He's ready to go. But he just said, I just have to learn some names. And coming from all these different angles, like where does that go? Where does that last? How do we handle that? Those of us who are watching and saying, we don't know if we want to full go in here because we have an idea of what this team is supposed to do and this is better than what we thought. And if you're coming from the outside, you didn't have expectations. So when you see them playing well and you're jumping in, maybe you're listening to this right now and you're jumping in and you're saying, this team's awesome, they're really good. They are playing great baseball. They are a good baseball team. I don't know that they're the best team in the National League. <laughs> I just... Right now, they have the best, they are the best team in the National League. They're 18 and 8. They're 10 games over 500. Are we ready to move predictions? Are if you're if you're just coming into the scene, are you are you full go here? And and the question is, is what's it going to look like if they fall? Because the last thing that guys like, for instance, me. The last thing that I'm going to say is I told you so. Like, why would I, why? That's not going to help. <laughs> that's not going to help anything. That's not what I'm going to say, right? I'm going to say, be patient. We knew that these times were coming as well. But if you're just stepping into this, if they start to go down, do you give up again? Because you're trained to do that. As a Pirates fan, you know it's coming. And if you act like it's not coming, or if, I don't want to say it that way. That sounds that sounds bad. But if if it does come and you say, well, I was in when they were good, but look, same old buckos. If that's how you're going to treat it, then I encourage you to, like, this is not fake. Stick around. This team will be fun. They might go through some bad stretches, but they will be fun. They will be fun again. They'll continue to do this. I don't know what it'll look like if they do start to fall. But the good thing is, is that they came out of the gate good. And you look at some of these teams in the league right now who are supposed to be good. I mean, let's go right in our division. St. Louis is 10 and 16 right now. If they start playing hot baseball, <laughs> if they start playing hot baseball, we may not notice it. I'm trying to look for an example of a team. How about Philadelphia? They started off so poorly. They are 7-3 and three in their last 10, and they just got back to 500. This is a very good baseball team in Philadelphia. I mean, the Dodgers right now are, are 500, but they've been playing 500 ball, even in their last 10. 
But you've got teams with these big expectations like San Diego, who's still playing 500 ball. They're sitting at 13 and 14. They still haven't done well. I got to find that one example that's really good. The Chicago White Sox, for for instance. The Seattle Mariners are 11 and 14. The White Sox are 7 and 18. These are teams that had expectations. If the White Sox go on a run, they're 7 and 18. They've got to go on a massive run. They're playing Tampa Bay right now, and they actually they just lost 14 to 5. So wait, that means I can excuse me. Let me refresh my my uh, standings page. Seven and nineteen, one and nine in their last ten. They've lost eight straight. So even if they go on a run, how fun is it going to be when you look at it and they've won seven in a row and you look at the standings and they're still fourteen and nineteen? The good thing about coming out of the gate like this, Baltimore, by the way, is seventeen and eight. The good thing about coming out of the gate this way is you're above ground. I don't know if I just talked about this, but being above ground and not digging out of a hole makes a world of difference. We might have just talked about this on Monday. We might have. So anyway, that's what makes this great. I mean, right now, 18 and 8, 10 games over 500, we could have a rough streak and be okay about it and still be in a good spot. But right now, top team, Tampa Bay's 21 and 5, so they're the team in major leagues that are ahead of us. Um but just uh 18 and 8, 17 and 8 would be Baltimore, the third team. Uh and then you'd get to your 17 and 9 uh Atlanta Braves. Who lost tonight? You know, it's it's kind of interesting. We give we give Andy Haynes and Oscar Marine a hard time. We've we've done that, you know, last year and, and whatnot. But that's what it looks like when you have a bad roster versus a good roster. This is what happens when players play well versus players not playing well. So if we're going to give them a hard time when players are not playing well, then we have to give them kudos when players are. So kudos to the pitching staff and Oscar Marine and what he's done. And I think most of us are pretty on board with him, especially after the Quintana stuff. Andy Haynes has been a little bit of a different story. But we if, if we remember the stories of Brian Reynolds working with him and how that's paid off and he's asked for some one-on-one at some different, uh, different points. And maybe we'll get into this a little bit more for Monday's show uh, when Jake's on. But just the idea of when do we check in all the way? When do we just say, my expectations for this team have changed? Fangraphs, I think, has them up to 80 wins at this point. Uh, Projection. Is it time we start moving those? Is it time we, I mean, not that we have to because they don't matter. But when do we start, you know, paying attention to this kind of stuff? When do we start saying this team is a very good team and we expect them to be in it till the end? When do we do that? Three more games this month and they're against the Washington Nationals. And then you open up next month against that 21 win Tampa Bay Rays. Three against the Nationals. You got a night game Friday and a couple day games this weekend. Then you have Monday off and you're in Tampa for three games Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. So, first test, pass. After this, I mean, because you could say Houston was technically the first test. Um, But that was kind of before the run. So we're going first test, past, 
Tampa's the next one, but it's not just Tampa. Then it's three against Toronto when they come back home. Then you get the Rockies again, and then it's Baltimore, who right now is the number three team in Major League Baseball. So we're going to figure out who's there. A couple games against the Tigers. Then you got the Diamondbacks and Rangers still trying to figure them out. Are they for real or not? Mariners, same thing. Giants. May is a manageable month. If they continue to play good baseball, they're going to continue to win games. Do you wait till the end of May? See where they're at at the end of May? I think that's probably fair. We'll talk about this more when Jake gets on. I think this is an interesting topic. Listen, I'm going to I'm going to cover one more thing here. We we haven't talked about Brian Reynolds yet. We're going to talk about Brian Reynolds. I know that this is just solo here. It's just me, so I don't want to take up too much time. I know that um for me personally, I definitely like feeding off of having conversation and somebody else to talk to. Um some of our Friday morning episodes or, or Friday episodes might just be like this. I might try to to fill it in with some other people, have some fun. We've had some um, some really cool people on here before, so maybe I'll try to get some of them on, uh, maybe some new people. Um, but for now, this is what it is. You got to deal with it. <laughs> Brian Reynolds. Let's talk about Brian Reynolds. We locked him up. Jake was also very bummed that he got to miss the episode after Brian Reynolds gets extended. We saw this coming. We knew this was coming. We said this was coming. If you were close to the situation, you were convinced it was coming. The trade request is the only thing that's weird about this whole thing. He's been open. He said he wanted to stay. Of course he stayed. I sent out a tweet earlier that says, MLB Network, every show on MLB Network. He clearly wanted to go, they would all say. He clearly wanted out of there. He requested a trade. He said, get me out of here now. It just wasn't like that. It just wasn't like that. It was never like that. He always said he wanted to be here. He wanted to stick around. He was very clear about that. The trade request was the thing that was weird. Anyway, we knew that this was coming. And when I look back and you say, well, why hasn't this happened yet? Everybody talked about opening day being that last day, right? Look at the schedule. We just got off of 17 consecutive days. The last off day we had was after the Boston Red Sox series. We came back to town. That's when everything broke. This is going to happen. He's going to sign. And then all of a sudden, it's op- it's the home opener and there's a snag. It's the opt-out. And everybody goes at all sorts of angles from this. That'll never get done. I told you, he's traded. He's as good as traded. It's never going to happen. You can't give him an opt-out. You have to give him the opt-out. When do you give him the opt-out? Stuff like that. Then you went on 17 consecutive days with a game. And wouldn't you know it, the first day off they get after that day, it's all worked out. So you could you could seemingly say this took two days at that point. Right? You could say that. The very next day off, the deal got done. And we all said, at, at home opener, ah, they'll get it done. They'll get it done because everybody's motivated to get it done. And then you wait, and then two weeks later, you get a text from somebody, one of your buddies that says, I thought they were going to get it done. Okay, well, I mean, I was at the point of saying, like, maybe it won't get done until the offseason, but it'll get done. And, you know, as impatient as we are, all you had to do is wait for the next day off. That's it. Pirates lock up Reynolds for eight years. Reynolds gets to stay where he wants to be. Everything makes sense. It seems like it's a really, to me, it's a fair deal. And I know there's a lot of people out there that say, oh, he left a lot of money on the table. He could have got a lot more. Sure. But there's something to be said when you sign early. And I know age-wise he's not, but this year and two more years of arbitration, he's signing early. He did not sign at free agency. 
when you sign early, or even the year before, when you sign early, there's some security involved. And anytime that happens, you are willing to sign. I mean, Hunter Green just signed for $53 million. I think it only got one year of his of his free agency. You know what I mean? Things like that happen. If you, the earlier you sign, the less that money has to be because you just want that security. I mean, what do you point to Byron Buxton and how many years in a row he was injured? I, I you know, I don't know. You look at Michael Conforto who had some breakout years in New York and decided not to not to sign the long-term deal, ends up being hurt, has a bad year. All of a sudden, he's coming back. He hits free agency, and it's maybe not the same. Maybe not the same money that he could have got. I don't know. There's, there's many more examples of that. Uh, throughout, and you can look at guys like Gregory Polanco, who got a lot of money and maybe never lived up to it. I don't think that he got too much, but it's the idea that like that's money that was guaranteed to him, whether he was going to be good or not. Jose Tabata, how 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 did that work out? I mean, there was money there. I, I don't remember how much that deal was worth, but he signed the deal, and he got the money that was guaranteed to him. This is a lot of money guaranteed to you. So I think this is super fair. I'm probably talking too long about that point of it. I like the no trade. I think that was always the way to go. I think as fans, we like the no trade. We don't want him traded. This is potentially a guy who will spend his career here. Potentially. Ah, deep breath. And Bob Nutting said he's not done? That it's only the beginning? Are you kidding me? Is that real? How much do we believe that? How much do we believe that this is only the beginning? Do we think it's the beginning? Like, is is it not the end this year? Do we find out at the All-Star break that Mitch Keller's extended? Is O'Neill Cruz maybe something that gets done in the winter? Like, we don't know. But they're not done? Interesting. Very interesting. Very, very, very exciting week. Very exciting week. We didn't even do this. You know, Jake's not here, so we don't have a lot of the clapping, but we got the Reynolds thing done. This is great. <laughs> is there like a little sound at the end of that thing where there's like somebody... I don't think that I didn't make that sound. There might be a sound at the end of that clip. I don't know. This is a big deal, guys. And this could be a lot more exciting, right? If we had all the fanfare and I planned to do a big thing. I know this is a little more of a of a calm setting when it's just me, but this is very good. Man. I'm, I'm, I'm really excited, but I don't have the words to express to really get into it. So I'm trying to avoid getting into it. Let's talk about the National Series and let's get off. Let's get out of here. For this Friday episode, listen, if you want any more, go back to Monday's episode. If you missed that, listen to that one. If you didn't quite finish it, go back and finish it. If this is the first time you're listening, click subscribe. Get the notifications when we got new stuff coming out. Mondays and Fridays, we got the new episodes coming out. If you're on YouTube, leave a comment. Click the like button, but leave a comment. Get into the conversation here on YouTube because the more comments we have and we can kind of interact, uh, maybe get some things to bring up in next week's or, or Monday's show. Excuse me. But leave a comment. I think that helps kind of push some to some other peoples and stuff too. I don't really understand all that stuff. So this weekend we have the Nationals. We have Rich Hill versus an old friend, Chad Cool. And then Saturday it's OGV versus Patrick Corbin. And Sunday Oviedo gets to bounce back 
and he faces Josiah Gray, which is the guy they got in the um, Trey Turner, Max Scherzer deal from L.A. That's a series win, guys. Go into Washington and win a series. This is a team that's down. Uh, what do we got here? Washington sitting right now at 9-15. and 15. Chad Cool is rocking a 736 ERA right now. Patrick Corbin a 588. And we know we I mean, I, I think if, if you guys are like me, you'll like the lefty lineup. That's been a good lineup for us. And then Josiah Gray on Sunday. This is like I said, this is the guy they got in the Max Scherzer Trey Turner thing. They got him, Kiebert Ruiz. Ruiz has already been extended to a big deal. Josiah Gray, a lot of talent. He is one and four, but he has a 293 ERA. Tells you a little bit about the offense there. They've made some deals. They've got some talent. CJ Abrams in, is around. I don't know that. I don't know how these guys are doing. I haven't really looked at their team much. I did not uh, get an opportunity to to dig into them, but. They've got some talent. They've got some guys that can that can play a little bit. They've got another old friend on their offensive side in Michael Chavis. He's played in eight games so far, hitting 222, 300 on base. Has yet to hit that first home run for the Nats. But either way, it looks like another series win going into Tampa. So... Man, the Nationals. Down. Nine and fifteen. So because I because I talked about because I talked about the Pirates and how good they're doing, let's take you through this. Pirates are in first place, 18 and 8. They're one and a half games ahead of Milwaukee. Three games ahead of Chicago, 14 and 10, seven and a half above Cincinnati, and at the very bottom, the 10 and 16 St. Louis Cardinals who I have touted, uh, I have said is loaded. And here they are at 10 and 16 with a minus five, which is, I mean, kudos to that offense to even have a minus five run differential because the pitching has been that bad. And they've only scored 117 runs, actually. So are the Reds, the Reds, we talk about how well they pitch, but they've given up more runs than the Cardinals. Reds bullpen, ladies and gentlemen. All right, I think that's it here for me today. That's probably a little too much of just my voice. So I will get out of the way, and I cannot wait for Sunday's show. And I cannot wait for this Tampa Bay series. How special can this team be? <laughs> How special? Thanks for listening to my dad and Uncle Jake on the Bridge to Bucktober podcast. Follow them on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram at Bridge the Number Two Bucktober. Don't forget to subscribe so you know when new episodes are released. Clear the deck, cannonball coming, and let's go, Bucks! <laughs>